Hi everyone. Welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. The purpose of these videos is to provide a solid foundational understanding of those foundational principles in microbiology um, without going into too much in, in extreme detail and losing people. If your instructor goes into more detail, covers other topics or whatever you need to learn, make sure that you learn the information that your instructor is requiring you to know and that is covered in your lectures. But a number of students are having trouble uh, and having great difficulty understanding this information, so I'm breaking it down and providing those foundational principles so that we can plug all the details in there. I hope you find these videos helpful. If you do, please hit like. You can hit subscribe for when I change, alter, update, or add new videos. And if you hit like, it lets me know that I'm being helpful so that I can continue to do these videos. Now, we have been talking about bacterial growth. We've talked about bacterial metabolism, bacterial growth in other videos and other things. What we're gonna talk about today is culturing or cultivating uh, bacteria and microbes. I'm referring to bacteria, but whenever I say bacteria, I'm also including other microorganisms, although our main focus in this class, since it's for health science majors, is to focus on actual bacteria themselves. We'll talk about viruses and parasites and other things later on. Now, when we talk about this, there's a lot of definitions that you need to know when it comes to culturing bacteria. So, when we talk about this stuff, um, one of the things we wanna talk about is a medium. The medium is whatever substance, this is going to be my abbreviation for bacteria. I'm going to use the beta for bacteria, okay? Because I'm not going to write the word bacterium out every single time that we need to. And so I'm going to use a little bit of shorthand. There's two things that I will use in my videos that if you jump in later on, you may not understand. I'm also going to use the mu and the OBE to stand for microbe, because I don't want to write this word out. Every time I had to write this out when we were lecturing, we would get, we would write, and I literally came up with these as my own personal shorthand when I was taking notes from a professor, okay? And because I couldn't write everything that they said, I couldn't write fast enough. And we didn't use a lot of PowerPoint back then, I'm that old. So the medium is whatever substance bacteria are grown on or in. It can be grown in a, in a liquid medium, like a broth. Um, it can be grown on a semi-solid uh, medium like auger, and we're gonna talk about these things. So when I say the medium, I mean whatever they're growing on or in. There's two major types of media. When we talk about a broth, we usually mean some kind of liquid medium, and there's different nutrient broths. And when we talk about auger, we're talking about a solid medium. And I say solid, but it's really a semi-solid. It's like gelatin, like jello. Um, it is a solid or semi-solid medium. At room temperature. It actually gels or solidifies at about 40 degrees Celsius or lower. So body temperature, room temperature, and lower. It is a liquid at really high temperatures. So when we autoclave this stuff, it is liquid like a broth. The difference is broth will stay liquid at room temperature, where when auger cools to room temperature, it becomes semi-solid or gel-like. It is made from a marine alga. It contains all of the nutrients or many of the nutrients that many microbes grow on, but it is also filled with these things called polysaccharides, large sugar molecules. And some of the polysaccharides in the um, auger allow for gelatinization. They allow it to gelatinize or become semi-solid at room temperature. And so it's a very common and easy to use medium and uh, many bacteria grow on different types of auger. And then we can augment or supplement our broth or auger with any of the nutritional requirements that certain bacteria need so that we can select for them or um, different indicators and chemicals that allow us to tell if one is growing or, the, uh, or not, okay? So you need to know that 
you know, whatever we're growing bacteria on is, uh, is called the medium. It can be liquid like broths, it can be an auger, and each of these can be altered in their chemical constituency so that we can grow specific bacteria or tell the difference between certain bacteria, which I'm about to talk about. So when it comes to these different media, one of the things that we can talk about is we can talk about um, a defined medium. When we talk about a defined medium, what that means is all chemical ingredients, or all ingredients, period, are known. We know exactly what's in it, and usually know the concentrations of the ingredients as well. Meaning, you could look up this recipe and you could make this from scratch without having to use a whole lot of um, cells like plants or yeast to grind up. We know everything that's in it and it's made from a recipe, okay? So this would be like taking all the ingredients out of your, out of your cabinet and making a cake from scratch, okay? Now, when we talk about a complex medium, and some people call them undefined, that means all chemical ingredients are not known exactly, okay? And some clues that you're looking at these media is that they're gonna have something that's called a lysate. A lysate means that something's been digested or they'll have the term digest. So if you see something that's not an, uh, a medium and you look up its recipe and it says it has reticulocyte lysate or it has protein digest or soy lysate or soy digest, um, some plant cell digest, pancreatic digest. If you see lysate or digest, that means they took some other organism, a plant, a yeast, uh, soybeans from plants, beef, um, some, some cow meat or something, they call it bo bovine serum, um, and they ground it up in a blender and made a liquid out of it or added it to auger. And because we digested those cells, we don't know everything that's in them. There's some components that are still not known, and so those would be called complex or undefined medium. We know that they have a lot of the nutrients and requirements for certain bacteria and microbes to grow, but we're not sure. Another thing that you'll see is peptone. When you see peptone, it means they're not exactly sure what's in there. It's some mix of peptides and things and so. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to different type of media, not only can they be defined or complex, whether it's a broth or an auger, there's some other terms that we can use to describe them. Um, when, it com when, when we talk about what's called a reduced medium, A reduced medium has components in it that decrease the oxygen concentration, okay? So they have a very low concentration of oxygen for growth of anaerobes. One that's very, very common is called thioglycolate. So there's a broth called fluid thioglycolate broth or FTB, and that thiol group will bind up any free oxygen, and they're really great for growing um, obligate anaerobes. So anytime we talk about a reduced medium, that means that we've reduced the oxygen concentration in there by electron reduction, and therefore it's good for growing um, anaerobes. And you'll use that a lot in labs. Okay, if it grows in that, then it's anaerobic. Now, uh, a few other that we can talk about. When we talk about what's called a selective medium, a selective medium means that um, it contains ingredients that promote the growth of some bacteria 
but not others. And remember, this is my abbreviation for the word bacterium. I'm going to use it a whole lot, or bacteria. So a selective media lets us select what we want to grow. And it can select or promote the growth of some bacteria, but not others. It inhibits the growth of specific bacteria. It's another way to think of it. Okay. So it has chemicals in it that select for or promote the growth of some bacteria, but inhibits the growth of others. And those chemical components would be called inhibitors. And so if I'm trying to grow um, gram-negative bacteria, then there are certain compounds and chemicals and ingredients that will prevent the growth of gram-positive bacteria, and so that would be a selective medium. Okay? Now, something that's similar to a selective medium is called an enriched medium. An enriched medium does contain specific ingredients that promote the growth of some bacteria but not others, or it inhibits the growth of specific bacteria. But what makes it different is it is, it is um, designed to allow the growth of low numbers of specific pathogens. So if I, was just, if I was trying to grow some kind of fecal coliform bacteria that is pathogenic, then I might use an enriched medium. And what that enriched medium does is not only does it select for certain organisms, but it also has chemical components or ingredients that allows it to just grow a certain number of bacteria, like a certain pathogen. I don't want them to grow like crazy, but I do want to grow some. So we call that an enriched, enriched medium. Very similar to selective, but this is the key. They're usually designed to grow low numbers of pathogens. Okay? They select for certain pathogens and then allow the growth of low numbers of them. Um, a differential medium can have a chemical in indicator that allows one to distinguish between types of bacteria. For example, there are certain bacteria of a similar genus that um, can grow on a, on a certain medium. But if I put some kind of indicator and usually, it's not always, but usually, it's a pH indicator. Something like phenol red that will change color if it becomes acidic. So um, what happens is I can grow bacteria on here and I can streak a plate on one side with one bacterium and on the other, a different bacterium, or I can grow a bacterium on here and if that bacterium is a fermenter, for example, and produces lactic acid, then when that certain medium becomes acidic, then we start to see sort of the, a pinkness showing up in the medium where the bacteria are growing. And so it starts to turn pink or red. That indicates that not only is the bacterium growing, but it's a fermenter. And if I grew two on here, two different bacteria, and I put a whole bunch on one side and some on the other, and the medium changes color from a neutral color to red, then I know this one's a fermenter and that one's not. So I can tell the difference between what I'm growing, hence differential medium. It allows us to distinguish between types of bacteria or to tell the difference between types of bacteria using some kind of chemical indicator. Okay? Um, I think that's most of the ones that I want to discuss. We talked about a reducing medium, uh, enriched medium, differential, um, I talked about anaerobic media, like, uh, like a reducing medium, like uh, thioglycolate. So we would also call those anaerobic media. Anaerobic media are media that have chemical components that bind up all the oxygen. We would also call those reducing media. Um, and finally, there are um, certain special types of, of conditions in which we can culture bacteria. Uh, for example, um, there's a whole group of bacteria uh, that 
there are some special conditions under which we can grow certain bacteria. There are things called capnophiles. Capnophiles love carbon dioxide, and therefore they have to grow in a concentration of high carbon dioxide. Um, so we would grow them in uh, an incubator that has a very rich carbon dioxide atmosphere. Uh, there's a thing called a candle jar. I'm, I'm not familiar, I don't think we've talked about this before, but there's a certain jar, a type of uh, medium where, or conditions in where I could grow plates in a jar where you light a candle. The candle will consume all the oxygen and produce carbon dioxide and becomes a very carbon dioxide rich environment. And so capnophiles can grow in rich carbon dioxide environments. It allows us to, to grow specific bacteria. Um, obligate anaerobes would require very low oxygen. And then um, uh, some other special conditions would be like if we're gonna grow uh, extreme pathogens and many pathogens, they don't have to be extreme pathogens, but if you're gonna grow pathogens, then sometimes you wanna use what's called a biosafety hood, okay? And if you have uh, anaerobes, they require an anaerobic environment like an anaerobic jar. Okay. Now, for some really extreme pathogens, you not only would, have, would you have to use a biosafety hood, you would also have to wear um, particular per personal protective equipment like the space suit that, people, that you see sometimes and you'd have to go through certain chambers or airlocks where there's a negative pressure so that nothing could escape. Anything that blows off your body would be sucked into a filtration system so that it doesn't escape that room. Biosafety hoods have that negative filtration system or negative air pressure, sometimes UV light to kill bacteria and things. And so the biosafety level of the, the biosafety level of the laboratory will determine if there's any special equipment you need. Like biosafety one would be any lab that you walk in. Biosafety level two would be like your microbiology lab that you're usually in where you have to wear a lab coat, goggles, and gloves under certain conditions. When you get to three and four, then we get to really, really extreme conditions with biosafety hoods and special personal protective equipment, airlocks, and other things. Okay, so, um, so we can use a variety of conditions in which to grow bacteria and different types of media. So, one of the things I want to talk about is some specific media that we can that we use in the laboratory. This is not going to be comprehensive and cover all of them, but these are going to recover some of the more common media that we grow bacteria in. So um, one of the simple ones that we can talk about is a nutrient broth, okay? Um, when we talk about a nutrient broth, it's simply a broth that has lots of the nutritional requirements of most bacteria. It's a very general, um, uh, generally used broth for growing things. And uh, we can look at, when we talk about nutrient broth, one of the times, one of the reasons we use a broth or uh, in a test tube is that you look at some of the growth characteristics and so when we talk about nutrient broth it's simply a liquid medium that has a lot of the nutritional requirements but one of the things we look at when we use this is the growth characteristics and you usually do this in a microbiology lab is that you grow some bacteria and you look at their growth characteristics and when we talk about their growth characteristics there's some terminology you should know so for example we can talk about turbidity. When they grow in the broth, is the broth, broth very turbid or not? And a turbidity simply means like a cloudiness to the broth. So if I grow some bacteria in a broth and there's, they're growing like this, that would be very low turbidity. If, they, if the broth ends up looking like this and it's very cloudy and hard to see through, then I would say that it, is a, it has a high turbidity. And you can literally hold the test tube up sometimes to some lettering on a paper, and if you can't see through it, then it's very turbid. So we talk about turbidity. Um, one of the things that we can talk about also is sedimentation or precipitation. To, so to sediment means to sort of, I don't know, form a sediment. But precipitation means to fall out of liquid. So when we talk about sedimentation or precipitation, sometimes we'll see a whole bunch of, a little clump of things at the bottom. And of course, if I disturb it, 
then it, I can increase the turbidity. But we talk about sedimentation or precipitation. So some bacteria, when they colonize and, and um, the colonies are very dense, they'll sink down to the bottom and sediment or precipitate out. If I talk about flocculation or flocculate, what that means is it's clumpy. The bacteria are growing in a medium, but what I might see is little mats of bacteria that are all kind of clumped together. And it's very, very clumpy looking and chunks of bacteria. And another term we can talk about is a pellicle. When you describe a pellicle on bacteria, here's our broth. The bacteria are usually growing in a little ring near the top, They're kind of floating, all floating on top. Now, sometimes we would mistake this for being anaerobic or aerobic only, but the bacteria, and very often aerobes will form a pellicle and anaerobes may not, um, but, and facultative anaerobes can do this, but we're, it's not a very good way of describing bacteria, but it's one way of doing it because some bacteria have a, a tendency to, to uh, precipitate, some have a, a tendency to form a pellicle or be flocculate, and we'll talk about those terminologies and terminology in describing them. And then when you grow them on a plate, you can talk about the bacterial shape, whether it's elevated, what the size, what the shape of the colony looks like. Are they round? Do they have lobulated edges? We're not going to talk about that right now. You'll do that in a lab, I'm sure. Now, um, one of the one of the um, media that we can grow on is I talked about fluid. Thioglycolate. Glycol means a sugar that's an alcohol form. So fluid glycothiolate broth or FTB. We said it's good for growing anaerobes because in it, it has some substances that will bind up all the free oxygen. And so when we look at tubes of this stuff, we will see a bunch of bacteria growing near the surface. We would say that those are aerobic bacteria. Or sometimes we would say that they are obligate anaerobic bacteria, or obligate aerobes. Okay, because they will not grow at areas where there's very little oxygen. If they grow throughout, then we can say that they're facultative anaerobes. If they grow in a little certain area, sort of near the middle, not too much oxygen, not too little, then we could say that they were micro aerophiles, which simply means they love air, but only a little bit. Too much oxygen and too little oxygen kills them, and then the last way that they would grow is if we're looking at this and they all grow at the bottom, then we would say that they are anaerobes, or we might say that they are obligate anaerobes because they can only grow in a low oxygen environment. Okay. So fluid thioglycolate does not have to be put in an anaerobic jar, by the way, because the fluid has something in it that binds up all the free oxygen, then bacteria that must have free oxygen can grow up here where there's air, but the further down you go, there's less and less and less oxygen, the more anaerobic they are, okay? So we would, if we were testing to see if something was aerobic or anaerobic, we might grow it in a uh, FTB tube, okay? Fluid thioglycolate, know that. Now, when it comes to certain media, we can describe the media as simple um, or complex or defined and undefined and um, enriched, and we can, uh, alter the components, again, to select for certain bacteria or differentiate or both select and differentiate between bacteria. And we're going to talk about some of those, okay? Um, so a few that I want to talk about that are selective media. One of them is called 6.5% salt auger. And as you can imagine, this is, has a high salt concentration which happens to be exactly 6.5%. Most bacteria are somewhere around 1.5% or less, okay? 
they grow somewhere at 1.5% um, salt concentration or lower, right? But there's some bacteria that tolerate high salt concentration. So this is selective for microorganisms. This is my abbreviation for micro, is the, like micrometer, but microorganisms that grow or require high salt concentrations. Okay, and it's a selective medium. And there are a few of these that grow in this, particularly if, like, for example, if you were gonna try to grow some kind of halophile, okay? Um, now, there are a few bacteria that grow in a high salt concentration. Uh, a couple of them would be Staphylococcus. There's certain staph infections. A number of these can grow in high salt concentration or at least tolerate it, so we would say that they're tolerant of high salt. Uh, some enterococci and aerococci do this as well. So, now remember, cocci simply describes the shape of the bacterium. They would be round. And then the other terms would be indicative of uh, a certain growth characteristic. Like in staph, we've talked about that. Entero simply usually means inside the gut. So anytime you see enterobacter, enterococci, enterobacillus, we're talking about something that's growing in the enteric region of the body or in the guts. And aerococci are things that require some oxygen. These are three groups of bacteria or genuses, uh, geni, that really can grow in some high salt concentrations. There are some others that are called extreme halophiles, and they would grow in really, really high salt concentrations. Um, not even enough that 6.5% uh, or 6.5% salt auger may not be enough for even those. Now, uh, another one of the media that we can look at is called GSA. This is called glucose salt auger. And as you can imagine, it has a lot of glucose and salt. And one of the things about this is it usually has almost only glucose as its sugar. And bacteria and microorganisms need sugar to make ATP, as we've talked about in previous videos. So one of the things that uh, I want you to know about this is that it uses glucose and salt, um, or it's, it selects for, it doesn't just use it, but it selects for bacteria or microorganisms that require glucose and salts for all their organic components. So they cannot convert things like mannitol or other sugars into some of the other organic components. They have to have glucose in order to grow. So it's selective for those that are glucose loving. It's also a defined medium in that we know every chemical component. That's about all I want you to know for, these, for this particular group, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Now the next one on the list is EMB or eosin methylene blue. And uh, I've sort of changed the order that I'm presenting these from the way that they appear in, text, in the textbooks or lab manuals. So I may step away and refer to my notes just so that I make sure I'm going in the correct order. These have a stuff called eosin, which happens to be a dye, and methylene blue, which is also a dye. Okay? So EMB auger or eosin, eosin methylene blue auger is both selective in that it will only allow specific bacteria to grow, plus it is differential. So it has some indicators in it. The dyes actually happen to be inhibitors of certain bacteria, and they can be indicators that tell us, is it this type of bacteria or that one? It'll select out certain groups, and then it will allow, allow us to tell the difference between two, two or more groups that are growing on it, okay? Um, so, uh, when I talk about eosin methylene blue, a couple of things I want to share, I want to mention. So both eosin, the dye, and the methylene blue, which I'm going to abbreviate as MB, inhibit gram-positive bacteria from growing. Or we can say that they select for 
gram-negative bacteria. Okay? It is a selective medium. And those two compounds prevent most gram-positive bacteria from growing. Okay? Also, um, one of the groups that, that it's selecting for are what we call gram-negative bacteria. And there's a particular, particular group that they can grow. They're particularly good at growing uh, what we call enterococci. Okay, so these are uh, bacteria that will grow inside the gut, and a group, a certain group of them are called uh, enteric rods, or a lot of times we'll say fecal coliform bacteria. One good example would be E. coli. They're very good at growing E. coli. So if it grows on EMB, most likely it's a fecal coliform bacteria. So let's say, for example, someone has a yeast infection. And there are other ways to test for it, but you could take a swab of any of the, the uh, secretions or uh, fluids produced in a yeast infection, and you could spread it on an EMB plate. And if it's a gram-negative bacteria that's fecal and coliform, then it most likely will grow. If it's not, it won't grow on this, especially gram-positive bacteria. Um, now, one of the things that we also know about it is that in addition to these being selective, it also has uh, some differential components to it. Right? Also, it contains lactose and sucrose. Now, not all bacteria can digest lactose and sucrose and ferment them. And so lactose and sucrose um, can be fermented. And when they are fermented, then you will get a very deep purple or a dark purple color to the colonies. Okay. They'll turn very, very, very dark in color. If they're non-fermented, then we have very light colors. So um, the fermenting bacteria will turn very dark if they are non-fermenters. The colonies are usually pretty neutral in color. They really, they really just don't produce a lot of color, okay? And they're usually non-fecal coliform, the non-fermenters. So a lot of fecal coliform bacteria are fermenters. So not only will they grow on this, but they'll also turn a very, very dark or deep purple color, okay? Again, this is a lot of gram-negative bacteria. And if you recall, or we actually haven't gone over a, a great deal of gram-positive and gram-negative yet, but gram-negative bacteria happen to be usually very pathogenic or the ones that create a lot of the issues in human health. Gram-positive aren't quite as pathogenic, and when we study the difference in their walls, we'll talk about that or in their, in their outer coverings. Okay? So that's eosinomethylene blue. The dyes not only uh, inhibit gram-positive bacteria, but they can also change color if uh, a bacterium is fermenting, like some of the fecal coliform bacteria, and as those indicators are in there, it will cause the colonies to be very, very dark purple, almost like a blackish purple color, okay? Now, <clears throat> another one that we can talk about, uh, this one's real simple. TSA, which is triptych soy auger, or triptychase soy auger, okay? This is a very common auger that's used for growing in general lots of bacteria. Um, it's, it's, it's not very selective. It's a very general one. It's, it's uh, undefined. It's a complex medium because basically it's got a lot of soy lysate or soy digest in it. And lots of bacteria can grow on that. So it's a very common one. It's not very selective. It's a very general, generally used um, auger for growing a lot of bacteria. Many things can grow on it. Now, um, we talked about glucose salt auger. We've talked about EMB. I want to make sure I don't skip any. There's one called hectin. And a lot of people want to say hectoin. I still actually say it sometimes, but um, hectin enteric auger. 
which is usually abbreviated HE. If you see a plate with HE written on it, then that's hectin uh, enteric auger. It is both selective and differential. Okay? That's one of the things that we know about this auger is that it allows us to select for certain bacteria and it help us, helps us differentiate. So it's both selective and differential. Okay? I wish I could write better. Now, let me grab a, a drink here. My throat is getting rather dry. If I were really good at editing videos, I would edit this out, but I'm not. Now, hectin enteric auger. A number of the things that it has. Um, it has bile salts. It has a stuff called bromo thymol blue and it has another stuff called fuchsin. Now bromo thymol blue and fuchsin, the color fuchsia, um, can be chemical indicators or dyes in many instances. And then the bile salts are just kind of a, the salts from bile. Now one of the things that we know about this is it allows the growth of what we call enterobacteriae. Okay? Enterobacteriae are a whole bunch of bacteria, and this is pronounced as the E and an E. The AE is always pronounced as an E, and so is the I. Enterobacteriae um, grow inside the gut. So again, this is one of those ones that selects for a lot of gram-negative bacteria. So the bile salts, the bromothymol blue, and the fuchsin can inhibit gram-positive bacteria from growing. So it does a similar thing to uh, EMB. And what you're going to find is, if you continue to do a lot of these, you're going to find that a lot of them are selective for gram-negative bacteria. So when we say it selects, it, is, it inhibits gram-positive, then we can also say that it is selective for gram-negative bacteria, okay? It allows the growth of gram-negative bacteria and prevents or inhibits the growth of gram-positive bacteria. And so, and one of the things that I used to use is like, for example, where do we secrete bile? Into the digestive tract. And that's where we have enterobacteriaceae. So it's really good for growing some of these gram-negative enterobacteriaceae. And it allows us to select for certain groups. And some of the, the um, two of the major groups that it can allow us to select for are called salmonella. You've heard of salmonella poisoning, a type of food poisoning, and shigella. And these two bacteria can grow in a lot of, um, of the foods that we eat and make you extremely sick, cause really bad food poisoning, and in some instances, death. Okay. Um, now, when I start to look at this medium, it also has some chemical indicators in it that allow us to differentiate. So it's selective for gram-negative bacteria, particularly Salmonella and Shigella, but there's a few other pathogens and enterobacteria seed that can grow in here. But if it grows, it's most likely one of those two. The chemical indicators are several fold. So um, one of the things we know is that it has lactose, which is a sugar, it contains sucrose, and it has another one called salicin from salicylic acid. So these three are sugars that can be fermented. To acids. And so when these, when some of these enteric bacteria ferment these sugars, it's going to make the, the medium become very acidic in its pH. And so there are some chemical indicators in here that allow us to see uh, which particular bacteria growing are fermenters. So if they are a fermenter, they usually produce a yellow or salmon colored colonies. If they can ferment these sugars, then they'll turn the medium sort of a yellowish color. Okay? If you have a non-fermenter, 
bacteria that are not capable of fermenting these sugars, then they usually have some kind of blue-green color. The colonies can grow sort of a bluish or greenish color. And if they reduce sulfur, so this, this, um, this particular medium also contains some sulfur-containing compounds, some thiol, glutes, thiol groups, and there's several of them. Um, but if they reduce sulfur into hydrogen sulfide, H2S, which is both a gas and an acid, then you get black colonies. The colonies can get very, very, very dark. So if it grows on this medium, most likely it's Shigella or Salmonella. And if they are fermenting, uh, there's a few other enterobacteria that can grow here. If they're fermenters, they will have yellow or salmon colored colonies. If they're non-fermenters, they tend to be blue-green. And if they reduce the sulfur um, that is present in the medium, then they'll, they'll use sulfur as an oxygen acceptor and they'll turn a very, very dark or black color, okay? Uh, I think that's what I want you to know about that. There's some more details I have written down in my notes, but this is enough for us to go over. Now, there's one more uh, medium I wanna talk about, and it's very commonly used in microbiology labs because it is both selective and differential, and it is called McConkie auger. Named after the scientist who came up with its recipe and its use, it is usually abbreviated MAC. So if you find a tube or uh, usually a Petri dish or plate that's growing uh, that has MAC written on it, it's McConkie auger. So a few things that we know about McConkie auger, it is both selective and differential. So a lot of times when it comes to the exams for this class, they're gonna ask you, which of the following media would be considered selective or differential or selective and differential? Which of the following media is not selective? Which of the following media is, uh, is complex or defined? And so any of the information that I write on the board here is stuff that you should know. Your instructor, again, might have you know, encyclopedic lists of these things, and some instructors do that. They'll list 18 different types of media and expect you to memorize them. It's like memorizing everything that's in toothpaste, you know, and who can do that? Only a few of us, and I have done that before, but only to impress somebody, and it's, it was stupid. So, <laughs> it was a waste of my time, but, oh, uh, so, so if this thing has um, bile salts in it, and it has uh, crystal violet. Now, crystal violet is a dye, but these are inhibitors and they inhibit gram-positive bacterial growth, which means it selects for gram-negative bacteria. You start to see a theme here. Many of our selective media select for gram-negative bacteria. Again, gram-negative bacteria cause a lot of the patho uh, pathogenesis in human beings. A lot of infections, a lot of food poisonings, and a lot of other problems. And so we wanna know, is it gram-negative or gram-positive? Most gram-positive bacteria are usually non-pathogenic. Um, a couple of other things that, that uh, we know about it. It has lactose for fermentation. And this is essentially, it's how we're going to, um, how we're gonna distinguish between certain bacteria in this. And it contains an, uh, a chemical indicator called uh, phenol red. Now, um, I'm sorry, phenol red is, is in a, a different one, neutral red. So it has lacto for fermentation and it has neutral red as an indicator. It's a pH indicator. So if the colonies are neutral in color, then it's a non-fermenter. But if the bacterium ferments, then one of the things we know is that the fermenters will grow as red colonies. They're sort of a red or pinkish color because they're gonna turn, as they produce acid for fermentation, 
then that will interact with the neutral red and they'll start to turn red. So they'll grow red colonies or grow with a red halo around them. Um, I think that's everything I want y'all to know about McConkie auger. So, listen. Um, we've been discussing bacterial growth in the past two videos. One of them, we looked at bacterial growth rates, and we looked at how we measure bacterial growth by increasing, by increasing in numbers and sort of the, the number of generations over time. We looked at the lag log phase, stationary phase, and decline phase. And then we talked about some of the nutritional and uh, environmental requirements for bacteria, temperature, pH, oxygen concentration, water and osmolarity or salt concentration, and some special um, chemical and, uh, requirements of bacteria. And you should know a lot of that. In this video, what we've been talking about is different types of media that we can create. Knowing all of those nutritional requirements and environmental requirements, we can use specific media to grow specific bacteria. And we can use these for tests. So when someone has a severe infection, what you could do is you could take a swab and you could run it through a whole bunch of these. You could grow it on some nutrient broth, you could grow it in some thioglycolate, fluid thioglycolate broth, and if it grows at the bottom, you know it's anaerobic. You could run it on certain plates. If you ran it on a McConkie plate, um, you would know that if it grows in an oxygen-rich environment, it's, it's not an anaerobe. If you grew it in an anaerobic jar and it still grows, it's anaerobic, right? Well, we would also know that uh, if it did grow, it's gram-negative, and if it turns the, the, uh, if the colonies are pink or red in color, then we know it's fermenting, okay? So I could also grow it on EMB and tell, am I growing something like, uh, or if I grow it on uh, not only EMB, but if I grow it on um, uh, MSA um, or any other augers, then Knowing all the results of everything might allow me to select for, well, I know it's gram negative and it grew on this, but not that and under these conditions, it's most likely one or two or these three major um, uh, pathogens that can cause this type of infection. Very often when a patient is getting ill, there can be a number of bacteria or microorganisms that are causing the problems. And so we would have to be like a sleuth, like a detective, like Sherlock Holmes, and look at all the clues and indicators, run all these tests, and get down to which specific um, small group of bacteria are causing the problems. It's almost like being a murder detective. You know, you start with a large number of candidates and your tests don't tell you always what they are, but what they can do is eliminate these. And then we another test eliminates this and eliminates that, and eventually you get down to a small handful of suspects Occasionally, you can limit it to a very, very, very small number of suspects. Like if you're looking for Salmonella and Shigella, you can run one test and figure it out right away. So these selective media and differential media and the different types of media allow us to identify bacteria. We can identify them by growth patterns, conditions in which they grow like pH, temperature, um, water concentration or salt concentration, and then we can grow for, um, with different selectors and different indicators so that we can select for certain bacteria and not grow um, the ones we're not desiring or looking for. And then we can differentiate between, okay, well, I know these are gram negative, but is it a fermenter or is it not? If it's a fermenter, it has to be one of these. If it's not, then it has to be one of these. So all of this allows us to sort of identify certain types of bacteria by growing them with certain cultures. And very often, you have to grow them on many different plates to figure out what, you, uh, what you're looking at. If you're a student in microbiology, you're, you're doing microbiology labs, you're probably going to do what's called an unknown lab or an unknown test, where you're giving a sample of, of bacteria or a microorganism growing, and then you gotta run all of these tests and grow all of these plates, and then you come back and look at your results, and you tell your instructor, I think the bacterium that you gave me is this. If you did it right and you know all of this, then you can figure out what your unknown is, very much like someone might do in a medical lab. Anyway, I hope that this was a little bit informative, or if not very informative. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you in the next video. If you did find it helpful, then please hit like and subscribe or leave me a nice message. 
Um, if you found it not helpful, then leave me a nasty message and uh, I'll respond accordingly. Anyway, hope you had as much fun as I did. See you in the next video.